3. B-24 Liberator Developed during the early stages of World War II, the consolidated B-24 Liberator holds the title of being the most produced American-made military aircraft of all time. Nearly 19,000 units rolled off the line between 1940 and 1945. It saw extensive use throughout the war as a heavy bomber. The first shipment of B-24 Liberators entered service for the British Royal Air Force RAF, in 1941. They were the first planes to routinely fly across the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and North America, and they fulfilled a variety of roles including as cargo carriers and air transports. Despite its popularity and versatility, the B-24 Liberator was less than ideal for a number of reasons. It was difficult to fly and performed poorly at low speeds compared to other bombers at the time. The aircraft was nevertheless critical to the Allied war effort, serving in every branch of the U.S. military along with the armies, navies, and air forces of numerous other countries. It played a primary role in the American strategic bombing campaigns in the Western European and Pacific theaters. Throughout the conflict, thousands of B-24s dropped hundreds of thousands of tons of explosives on Axis military and industrial targets. One American unit, known as the 44th Bombardment Group, used its B-24 bombers to carry out 344 missions against the Axis powers starting in November 1942. The B-24 was also used by the U.S. Army Air Forces to carry out a major attack on the Axis-controlled oil fields and refineries around Ploiesht, Romania. On August 1, 1943, nearly 200 Liberators descended on the city as part of Operation Tidal Wave which sought to destroy the refinery that supplied up to 60% of the Axis power's fuel. The attack only lasted around 30 minutes, but it turned out to be the aircraft's costliest mission, with 52 of the planes being shot down. In addition to participating in conventional combat, the B-24 was used to carry out classified missions. In early 1944, the U.S. Army Air Forces and a former American intelligence agency known as the Office of Strategic Services collaborated to drop weapons and other supplies to French resistance fighters in a mission codenamed Operation Carpetbagger. By the time the war ended, the B-24 and other early bombers had been rendered obsolete by newer aircraft. There are only 13 known surviving Liberators today and some of them are only partially intact. A handful of others remain scattered in various parts of the world where they crashed decades earlier. One can be found in Alaska's Aleutian Islands, where it crash-landed in 1942 while on weather reconnaissance duty, due to bad conditions, which prevented it from landing in a nearby airfield. The pilot managed to land the aircraft safely on its belly even after the tail broke off in mid-air. All crew members walked away uninjured, except Brigadier General William E. Lind, who suffered a broken collarbone. They spent the night at the crash site, where they luckily had a supply of food to stave off hunger and enough supplies to start a fire. Another B-24 Liberator nicknamed Heaven Can Wait was shot down over Papua New Guinea in 1944 during a mission to disrupt a Japanese supply chain. The aircraft and its 11-member crew remained missing for more than 70 years. Experts finally located the wreck 200 feet, or 61 meters, underwater at the bottom of Hansa Bay. While surveying fire damage in 1994, a park ranger discovered a long-missing B-24 wreck in Australia's Kroombit Tops National Park. Nicknamed Beautiful Betsy, the plane had suffered previous damage and was only being used for short flights when it disappeared, somewhere between Darwin and Brisbane, taking six American soldiers and two British service members with it. Numerous search expeditions failed to find the men or the missing B-24. When the wreck was finally found, the crew members' remains were recovered at the site. There's another B-24 sitting at an elevation of 12,637 feet, or 3,852 meters, on Arizona's tallest mountain, Humphreys Peak. The aircraft was being flown by a U.S. Army Air Corps crew one night in 1944, when it crashed into the mountainside, landing on a bed of boulders in a remote area that's extremely difficult to get to. All eight crew members died, and the B-24 was destroyed. During the 1950s, the United States Forest Service 
USFS apparently got tired of hikers mistaking the wreck as recent and reporting it, so they blew it up with dynamite to further scatter the debris and make it clear that what's left of the plane had been sitting there for quite some time. Today, only parts of the aircraft are recognizable, including some engine parts and a nearly intact wing. These are just a handful of the mostly destroyed B-24 remnants that dot the globe. They serve as a reminder of an era when fighter aircraft were in their infancy and the enormous cost in human lives that the war's allied victory came at. Have you ever been to a war museum? Tell us in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. 2. Sukhoi Su-15 Known by its NATO codename, Flagon, the Soviet-built Sukhoi Su-15 supersonic jet was developed in the early 1960s. To replace its aging and unreliable predecessors, the Su-9 Fishpot and Su-11 Fishpot C. Its main purpose was to intercept the American-made Boeing B-52 Stratofortress and the Lockhead U-2, as well as the V-bombers of the British Royal Air Force. The Su-15 wasn't the Soviet Union's fastest supersonic aircraft, nor was it designed to intercept the most formidable of enemy targets. As a Cold War-era fighter jet, it also never saw combat, so it's impossible to say how it would have performed in the event of actual warfare, but it fulfilled its purpose and was a frontline design of the Soviet Air Force from the time it entered service in 1965 to its retirement in 1993. The aircraft was equipped with sophisticated radar and a variety of other systems that enabled it to respond to threats with precision, efficiency, and effectiveness. It also had a fast climb rate and could maintain high speeds at high altitudes. Despite its strengths, the Su-15 fell short in several ways. Its radar lacked look-down, shoot-down capability, which, unlike conventional radar, continues working even when it's pointed at the ground. In an era that saw the development of new low-flying bombers, having radar that could focus downward was imperative. Consequently, the Su-15 eventually fell to the back burner in favor of the more advanced MiG-23P fighter aircraft, but it remained in service until the Iron Curtain collapsed. In addition to any operational weaknesses it may have had, the Su-15 was involved in several controversial encounters with civilian airliners during its career. As a result, it became known as the Boeing Killer, and not in the context that the Soviet Union would have liked. The first incident happened in 1978, when a Korean Airlines Flight 902 crossed over into Soviet airspace over Murmansk. An Su-15 struck the Boeing 707 with a missile, and while the damaged commercial aircraft survived the hit and the forced landing it made on a frozen lake, the two passengers did not. Just a handful of years later, in 1983, a Boeing 747 jumbo jet flying under Korean Airlines veered into restricted airspace near Monorun Island in the Soviet Union's Far East region. An Su-15 pilot fired at the plane and struck its tail, disabling the aircraft's control surfaces. The 747 plunged into the Sea of Japan, killing all 256 passengers and 23 crew members. In the tragedy's aftermath, Soviet authorities accused the aircraft of being on a spy mission and claimed that its crews ignored orders to land. Then-President Ronald Reagan was unconvinced and condemned the incident as an act of Soviet barbarism. The Su-15 was also eventually tied to the death of Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first man to ever travel to space. Gagarin passed away under mysterious circumstances in 1968, and his death remained shrouded in mystery for 45 years, until 2013, when the details were finally released to the public. As it turned out, a malfunctioning Su-15 came dangerously close as it passed an MiG-15, being flown by Gagarin, forcing him to make a sharp turn to avoid colliding. He lost control of the aircraft as it went into a spiral and crashed into the ground. The Su-15 nevertheless remained in service for years to come. It was abruptly retired in 1993 to comply with the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, which imposed limits on certain military equipment in Europe and mandated the destruction of excess machinery. Most Su-15s were scrapped, but a few were stored for emergency use. In 2014, 
Severe flooding struck the city of Magadan in Russia's Far East. Photos that appeared online showed the city's overflowing river washing away two severely damaged Su-15s, which were plucked from the water and scrapped. Today, there are at least a handful of Su-15s languishing in various states of neglect, in fields and outside derelict buildings throughout Russia including at the defunct Kodinka Aerodome Airport in Moscow. 1. Boeing 747 After losing out on a military contract to develop an oversized jet during the 1960s, executives at Boeing brainstormed how they could sell their idea to the civilian market. They had good timing. Passenger flight was booming, and existing airlines were struggling to keep up with customer demand. At the same time, commercial flying was gaining popularity among the American middle class, but it was still pretty expensive. Boeing responded to these circumstances by repurposing its military jet as a passenger aircraft and marketing it as a way to make flying more affordable and to relieve the growing problem of airport congestion. The company rolled its finished product into public view for the first time in 1968. Famously known as the 747, it was the world's first ever jumbo jet, and it was unlike any aircraft anyone had ever seen before. Measuring 231 feet, 70 meters long, and with a wingspan of 195 feet, 59 meters, and a tail as high as a six-story building, spectators were awestruck by the aircraft's sheer size. The bi-level passenger plane ushered in a new era of flight travel and remains iconic today for its distinctive hump and its colossal proportions, which have been exceeded by just a handful of other passenger airliners. Powered by four Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines, the 747 typically accommodated 366 passengers, spread across three classes. The plane's earlier versions used the upper level as premium lounge space, with some even offering live piano music. Airlines eventually did away with the lounges in favor of squeezing more seats onto the aircraft. Some variants, like the 747-400, had room for as many as 400 or even 500 or more passengers. As predicted, the advent of the jumbo jet achieved its goals of relieving airport congestion and making travel more affordable. It was no longer a luxury afforded mainly to the affluent and wealthy classes but something that fell within the average person's budget. For travelers, the lower costs meant being able to visit far-flung destinations that were once extremely costly or difficult to reach. And for airliners, it meant more passengers, and therefore more sales and increased profits. In the meantime, the 747 continued catering to travelers who could afford to fly in style, nicknamed the Queen of the Skies. It went down in history as one of the most successful commercial planes of all time. Over 1,500 747s were built during its production years, and while all US-based airlines have discontinued their use of the aircraft, it continues to fly both commercially and as a cargo jet more than 50 years after it entered service. But its use is admittedly declining, and aviation experts have been warning for years that the era of the jumbo jet is coming to an end. The airline industry has struggled with decreased ridership numerous times over the last few decades, including after the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Towers in 2001, during the global recession of 2008 and 2009, and more recently, when the COVID-19 pandemic brought life around the world to a virtual standstill. Between rising fuel costs and less travelers, it became increasingly difficult for airlines to keep their jumbo jets profitable. At the same time companies were taking their 747s out of service, they also stopped ordering more. Those who continued using jumbo jets increasingly turned to more modern and fuel-efficient models. Shipping companies also began opting for different aircraft, and in December 2022, the final Boeing 747 rolled off the production line in Everett, Washington. Today, there are more 747s on the ground than there are in the sky. Many sit quietly tucked away in large storage facilities called boneyards, where they arrived during the COVID-19 pandemic with an uncertain future. Others languish outside airports, in fields, and wherever else they can fit slowly crumbling to the effects of time while they wait to either be repurposed or scrapped. 
In 2019, the Bahraini government sank a 747 into the Parisian Gulf as a scuba diving attraction. More recently, a museum owner in Oregon has vowed to restore a derelict 747 sitting outside its facility as a permanent exhibit for visitors. The aircraft will always remain iconic in its own right, but it's far more likely to become a closed chapter in history than it is to relive the popularity of its glory days. Thanks for watching. Which one of these planes impressed you the most? Tell us in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.